get ready to roll. If you guys have any questions, we will have a question and answer session at the end. We're gonna start this first section. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the history of photography as well as pictorialism and really looking at kind of the foundations of where we're gonna go from there. And then Patty is gonna take it away. A little artist lecture, and then we'll have a discussion with some Q&A. So if you do have questions, please leave them until then. Um, and we'll be happy to field those questions then. So I'm gonna get started with my screen share. So here we go. All right, so this is the newest exhibition at Southern Allegheny's Museum of Art. This is the implications of the camera where we're looking at pictorialism, replications in a new era. And this is the first part of our virtual lecture series, which is pictorialism and society's history with Pat Patty Kennedy Zafford. So um, just as a reminder, your financial support does help keep our doors open for free. It helps us um, reach more of the community in our area. So please consider donating to Southern Allegheny's Museum of Art um, at the link provided. It really helps us bring programs like these to people, not only in our backyard, but throughout the world. Um, and this exhibition, The Implications of the Camera, it's on view at Sama Altoona starting January 12th. Um, and exhibition sponsors are Mr. and Mrs. Michael Struber. And please come on down. It's a three-part exhibition, which I'm going to lightly introduce now, but you're really going to want to see it in person if you can. We will also have a virtual tour available once the exhibition is fully installed. So Pictorialism is our exhibition in the Wolf Gallery. And this is a exhibition of late 1800s and early 1900s photographs from our permanent collection. You'll see artists such as Alfred Stieglitz, Edward Weston, Margaret Burke White, Edward Curtis, and Edward Steichen. These are all giants oh. of photography um, who Here's. were at one time working towards the goals um, of pictorialism and kind of a painterly aesthetic with photography. Um, this new era, we are going to be looking at contemporary photography, both through how photography can be used in a lot of different mediums. So photography with sculpture, fiber arts, 3D rendering software, and these are all contemporary artists who use photography in some way, but might not be considered traditional photographers. And then replications, that will be on view in the Detweiler Gallery. And in here, we're looking at the reproducibility of artwork, which is something photography has been dealing with since its birth. But Artists such as Joseph Albers, Andy Warhol, Norman Rockwell, Robert Rauschenberg were all in the exhibition, all used it to their artistic gain. So that's silk screen printing, that's um, replication processes that get massive amounts of artwork out there um, in a really exciting way. So this exhibition really goes from this kind of origin of photography into you know, pop art and contemporary photography and contemporary art. So, I'm going to do a little background on photography's origins. It's really exciting um, because for me, I'm, I love photography and the way it started kind of feels like magic to me. When we think about the phones that we have in our back pockets, we can take a picture of anything, anytime, anywhere pretty much. But photography really started out as basically magic. We have the camera obscura, which is what we see here. It's a darkened room, and if you, dark, if you have a darkened room and you only have a tiny little hole, light will stream in and project into that darkened room. What is on the outside will be projected inside. So these are, um, these are natural projections. It's not that you need the projector to plug in. This is a phenomenon that's fascinating and beautiful. If you ever get to do it, I would encourage you to try that. Um, and it really behaves the same way that our eyes do. So our eyes take in that visual information and do, and you know, it flips around and it's projected in through our eyes. So the camera is really this darkened room and it just is able to capture the light in a way that is really exciting. And this is another picture of what would happen if you were to say black out all the, all the windows and have one little prick in there that then the light streams through. It's a really exciting process. And it was actually used also in drawing and painting because they found out that they could make the darkened room into a box that then got streamed through and then became tracing, something you could trace. You could use it to really capture the exact thing that was happening on the other side 
of the box through tracing. So this is how photography got started, and they really wanted to figure out how to adhere the light onto something. So whether that was metal or, or paper, um, they wanted to adhere light. And so that's how you get here with this great quote by Louis Daguerre, I have seized the light, I have arrested its flight, which is to me such a poetic way to see photography as a way to take light, take what's in front of you and capture it, to have light seized and, and represented in a new way. And this, this is a really a magical experience to have light be able to reflect reality is really exciting. So photography started off as this documentary tool. It was invented by scientists to, you know, inventors to create a way to capture reality. And so they often would do things like studies of leaves, for example, of different ways that things were moving. They could really capture that with the camera. And as this became more common for people to capture what was happening in reality, it became known as straight photography. And straight photography is a style of photography that attempts to depict a scene or subject in sharp focus or detail. It's really trying to take what's out there and bring it almost exactly here. And this can still be done very artistically and it's very beautiful, but there was kind of a reaction to this around the turn of the century and they wanted to make photographs that were perhaps more painterly. They wanted them to look more like paintings um, than necessarily an exact translation of the outside world. So photography starts to become an art medium and being used as a tool for self-expression. And we start to see that blend with work like this. This is a photograph by Margaret Burke White that you'll see at the exhibition here at SAMA. Um, and we can see how they're translating, they're kind of walking this line. It's not an exact like here is a bug. It is an artistic representation of this caterpillar's birth from caterpillar to butterfly. And that's what this series is. So she's documenting that process, but she really is trying to do that in a beautiful way. Um, the steerage with Alfred Stieglitz, this is also in our exhibition. We could really spend two hours on this, um, but this is really where you start to see as they translate from a very straightforward um, type of photography into more painterly aesthetics. Here with Edward Westens, who's also in our exhibition, as well as Edward Steichen. So they're really playing around with a lot of the visual narratives that they're seeing in painting and finding new ways to um, go about that. So I'm going to take a little, little water break. All right, pictorialism. So this is the, the official name of people basically being like, Straight photography was great, but I want to do something that's more painterly. So for the pictorialist, a photograph, like a painting, drawing, or engraving, was a way of projecting an emotional intent into the viewer's realm of imagination. So they were looking at a photograph doesn't just have to be reality. I can put my emotional intent into it. I can use it as a tool for artistic self-expression. This is really the basis kind of for pictorialism. And this being that photographs can be used in artistic expression. They would use soft focus, uh, special filters. They would sometimes coat their lens with things like Vaseline to make it look more like an environment. Um, they did burning and dodging, which are tools you use in the darkroom, and they would manipulate their photographs to make them look different and change the reality after they had taken the photograph or while they were taking the photograph. And these give way to the photo successionists who basically formed an official fan club. So it's like, you can be a fan of the Steelers, you could be a fan of pictorialists. And the photo successionists were the group of merry folks who supported this idea of pictorialism, but really wanted to campaign for photography being a fine art medium, to be accepted by the institutions, to have shows and exhibitions, galleries, museums want photography. So these groups, it's a New York photo collective that actively worked towards that. And that was started by Alfred Stieglitz. He said, photo succession actually means seceding from the accepted idea of what constitutes a photograph. And that quote really starts to lead us through this idea that pictorialism is to create a painterly photograph 
and to create a photograph that is rich in the visual tradition of art and also to challenge what a photograph is in the first place. And that's what we start to do as we move from this exhibition into the contemporary exhibition. So we can see how photography can change and be malleable, be a loose definition um, as we move along. So this is another photograph. This is by Edward Steichen. And we saw one of his works earlier, and this is a much more pictorialist style of photography. He, this, this is in the exhibition, and you can see it's kind of moody, it's cloudy, it's got high contrast. You're really in an emotional space with this. It's not just an experience of reality. This is also them experiencing um, a mood that he's put into it. Clarence H. White was very important. This is in our exhibition. He helped educate people on how to use cameras, on how to make pictorialist photographs, and was very influential in creating schools for photography. And Thomas Eakins, you might know as a you know, pretty, pretty famous uh, painter, and he would use photography as studies for him to then go and paint from. So this is his photograph of Walt Whitman in our exhibition, and he used a lot of pictorialist styles to capture um, studies in the same way he was going to start to paint. And I want to make them live forever. This is a quote from Edward Curtis, and Edward Curtis is going to play a big role here as we transition to Patty's lecture, because Edward Curtis made it his point to photograph Native people here in the United States. Um, it was his life goal, and he photographed them, thousands of photographs. And he, we have him in the exhibition, and his photographs were very much, they weren't just, I'm going to document these people as objects, but more he wanted to document their way of life, their beauty, um, and often romanticize their experiences. Um, in, in what is a beautiful and pictorialist style with shallow depths of field, he's just really trying to grasp the beauty of this experience of him living with these people um, for, for really decades um, in his life and creating um, life work about, around this. And Patty's going to talk a lot more about that as well, a lot more about how this work works with her work, but he was uh, very influential in being really the first visual anthropologist creating an ethno ethnographical study uh, through photography. And these are some of the artists here on view at Sama Altuna. So if you come down, that is in the Wolf Gallery. We have quite a few more, but these are the ones really working in that pictorialist style. And back to this quote, a seceding from the accepted idea of what constitutes a photograph. We're moving from the pictorialists um, you know, and traditionalists into a new era. And this new era is really looking at how photography can be used in many ways as not just the primary medium, but as a medium that can help express things. So here you're looking at three different artworks that are using photography in different ways to, to reach a conceptual end goal. So the middle one in the back there, that is Patty, Patty Kennedy Zafford's A Shared Destiny. Um, this is work by April Fridges. These are combinations of photographs and epoxy. So she's using kind of a sculptural language. And as we move forward this lecture series, we're going to be looking at all sorts of different ways that photography is informing the conceptual goals of each of these artists. So this, a shared destiny, um, Patty, I'm going to hand it off to you in a few minutes here, but I do want to give you a little introduction. So Patty Kennedy Zafford has been telling stories through the medium of textiles and art quilts for nearly 30 years, creating thought-provoking narratives using fabrics, dyes, silk screens, and ink to develop a visual dialogue with the viewer. The interpretation of each piece is conceived through the lens of individual experiences, memories, or perspectives. Her quilts marry a lifelong fascination with photography, history, and stitch, often reflecting faces of pride and dignity, sometimes under challenging cir circumstances. Um, and, and we are so thrilled to have this. It's absolutely beautiful in person. When you get here, please, it's one that you're really going to want to spend some time with because the detail is just so incredible. Um, and Patty, I'm going to hand it off to you here. So I'm going to stop my screen sharing and hand it to you. <laughs> then I will start my screen sharing. So you just need to give me a second. 
and I will do that and start with mine. So yes, in fact, um, I have been working with photography in my textile quilts for over 20 years, actually 30 years. But in the last decade, I have focused completely on historical images. And this is the piece that is um, in Altoona right now. It is 100 inches wide. The um, images are as big as I physically could print myself. And this is a shared destiny, which it was the second piece that was very um, much created after that. And I realized that. Pat, Pat a, your, your screen isn't up. What? We're not seeing your screen. At least I'm not. I'm sorry. It, Hannah, are you seeing my screen? I am not. Okay, hold on. Give me a second. I know what I did. I didn't hit the screen share button. Thank you for stopping me. <laughs> All right, now we're going to try again. Perfect. We can see it now. So if you go into presenter mode here. All right, here we are. Ooh, perfect. So, so uh, you heard what I said about the very first slide. So this was, this is the second one. And this is a shared destiny, which I made actually um, prior to the one that is at SAMA right now. It's a little bit smaller. Um, and what I attempted to do with this particular quilt was to make the images larger than life. So the silk screens were truly as large as I could reach with my body and I'm pretty tall. And so I was just captivated by Edward Curtis and in particular, the image on the right. And so usually what I do is when I find these images and these are from the Library of Congress, I usually then try to find some accompanying images. Edward Curtis, um, I admire only because he devoted over 20 years of his life documenting um, the life of Native Americans in the United States and produced over 40,000 images, many of which are available on the Library of Congress. And he looks like such a dapper guy, I had to put this picture in. This was the very first image I discovered on the website of the Library of Congress that he had taken in 1910. And it was the beginning of the inspiration of my Native American series. The very first quilt I made using that image and then a, child, a, a, a child's image from Edward Curtis, and then this young princess, which her name was Lucille. Word has it, or rumor, or legend, I would say legend is the word, is that the young princess is the reason that Edward Curtis decided to spend his life documenting the people um, in the various tribes in the, across the United States, and especially in the West, um, the various Native American tribes. So this was sort of a small um, silk screen. I had just sort of begun silk screening at that time. So these images are only about 12 inches high. The ones in the uh, piece that are at SAMA right now are 30 inches high. So they were larger than life. And as you can see, I, I hand dye all of my fabric, which for me is a really relevant part. This is another crow man that um, Edward Curtis took and I included him in the grouping that is at the um, Altoona Museum as well. So how do I begin? Well, when I see the images is when I start going, what I call going to the buckets. In The Godfather, they go to the mattresses. When I start, I go to the buckets. And I start dyeing fabric. And the, the photographs influence the fabric that, and the coloration of the dyes that I want to utilize. What is going to convey the story best? With the Native Americans, it's really, really fun because you can play with all these beautiful colors, beautiful dye techniques, resist techniques, and, and gradations as you see on the left. Most of the fabric is dyed at least two or three times to get a surface design. Then, as you can see here, they go on my design wall and I kind of line them up to get an idea. Do I have enough of the color I want? Do I have enough gold? Do I have enough red? And half the time I have to go back to the bucket. So it takes me, probably two to three weeks, if not more, to dye all of the fabric that I feel is a good representation to start a quilt. 
Then once the fabric is done, it's ironed and then ironed onto freezer paper. A lot of people ask me why I do that, but once they try it, they're sunk because when you iron the fabric onto freezer paper, you can actually print like paper instead of printing like silk screening a t-shirt, which is very difficult to do, the fabric becomes a sheet of paper. So here I am setting up the screen. It is a photo emulsion screen and getting ready to print. I print at Artist Image Resource, Resource which is in the north side of Pittsburgh. It is a um, full blown print shop and supports artists. I can rent studio time there and keep the mess at the at, at AIR instead of at home because it can be a really messy process. They help me burn the screens, they do the photo emulsion part, even and I do all the printing myself. So here is a, just an image showing. This is a smaller screen, not as big as some of the others I've done in the past, but it is a very old school kind of technique, just like Andy Warhol used to hand print his screens or his uh, work. I am doing the same, um, silk screening hand dyed fabric. So when I return home, like for example, with the Home of the Brave piece, I return home with piles of beautiful prints. And that's when the real work begins because sometimes the prints don't look exactly like you planned originally. Sometimes they look better than you planned. And I usually print at least two images for every one I think I'm going to need. And this is the piece that is at SAMA right now. This is Home of the Brave. It's a diptych and it is a hundred inches wide. So it is one of the larger pieces. If you um, wonder who is doing all this beautiful photography of my work, by the way, I see that he's in the audience. Uh, my friend Larry Berman and every single image of my work that you see here was photographed by Larry. He's been doing my work for a long time and I think he does a great job. And here's a close up of that. And you can see that I do add um, text or some sort of historical imagery to a lot of my quilts. It, the reason it does, it puts it into context. So for example, this perfect title that's on the left, that was a for sale sign of selling what they called Indian lands for sale. And then the other part was part of a um, government documentation about the immigration of Indians, in other words, moving them away from their homelands into the, into the reservations. So this was another um, photograph that is truly one of my absolute favorites that Edward Curtis took. He called it Navajo Boy. It was taken in 1906. I just was totally captivated by his face, by everything about him. And of course, he inspired wonderful hand dyeing and brilliant colors. And I chose another Navajo um, image to go with him. He's actually from a different tribe and from a different time period. But sometimes I try to sort of create this familiar thing and uh, familial thing. And I sort of thought that he looked like he could be his father. So the way I viewed this quilt was a father and a son. Here is a detail, and again, this has some of those uh, typeset from uh, Indian Land for Sale, Get a Home of Your Own. Um, but you can see how the hand dyed fabric really, I think, adds a tremendous amount to the images. And here's another small quilt that I also made, which showcases the hand dyed fabric used from uh, prints that were from that same first print session. Now, another person who um, has influenced a tremendous amount of my work was Lewis Hine, who was a school teacher in New York City who left his job and became an investigative journalist and photographer for the Child Labor Relations Committee in 1908. And he traveled the country for almost 20 years documenting child labor and had a tremendous influence with photographs like this, for example, on the laws and the, the sort of attitude about using children in 
in any sort of factory setting, coal mine or whatever, and definitely was an influential factor in the passing of the Keating Owens Act in 1916. And this is Porter Martin, who again, I discovered him in the Library of Congress, 1908, and I was captivated. He was 11 years old. He doesn't even have a lamp on his head. He has actually a flame on his head. That's how these children, and he was working as a coal miner in 1908 as a child. So what does that make me do? That sends me down to the buckets again. I can't make bright colors. I have to interpret that photograph. What was it like? What were the colorations? What do you imagine? What I imagined ended up being this. So here is Porter Martin. Um, I put him again with another young boy that was a mule driver and um, groups of the breaker boys. And the notations in these were the notations that Lewis Hine, he would make little notations of his photographs, sometimes the name of a person, sometimes just the location. A lot of the children were afraid to speak to him and the bosses of course didn't want him to speak to them or take their photographs. So he did it all surreptitiously. But Porter Martin was one person because of his name and location that I was actually able to find on genealogy. He continued to be a coal miner and lived to be 88 years old, which I always find that kind of thing just fascinating. And here's a close up of those images, the breaker boys, Porter and the mule driver. And here's the original image that Lewis Hine took of the Breaker Boys. Some of these boys were as young as seven and eight years old. So they're sort of irresistible. If you want to tell a story, want to reflect on history, remind people of a time period that they probably knew nothing about, I think this is a good way to do it. And so again, I use these images in a second quilt. The coloration is quite different because I discovered that the only time these boys came up from the shaft was just to eat lunch. So I thought what it must be like that they only for maybe 20 or 30 minutes a day got to see daylight and probably I sort of thought this was what it felt like to them almost blinding before they had to go back down into the shaft. So this is glimpse of daylight. One of my favorite images that Lewis Hine took was Rosie Burdage, who was a oyster shucker in South Carolina. And she was part of the canneries. Those were widely staffed all by children. She was shucking oysters all day long from sunrise to sunset with her bare hands. And even though she lived near the sea, she never was able to go to the beach. Resulting in this quilt, and again, you'll see that the colorations that I chose are sort of that gritty, sandy, imagine what her, her sort of surroundings were like. She was in the sun of South Carolina, but she was in a very gritty environment. And all of these children were very, very young. She was um, barely 10 years old. And here is another showing some of the notes that Lewis Hine made and those notes then are reflected in photo transfer on onto the quilt. And it is the, another legend that um, Lewis Hine was so enraptured by Rosie that four years later he went back to see if he could find her and he was delighted to discover that he had convinced her mother to pull her out of the cannery and send her to school. And she did go to school and ended up graduating. So here's another one by Lewis Hine, and this is Giles Newsom. And Giles had just injured his hand because he was a doffer boy. And these were in the cotton mills of North Carolina. And what they had these boys do was they were changing the spools of thread while the mills were still running. They didn't shut them down. So unfortunately, he had had an accident I found his image really compelling and again searched out other images that were taken during that same time period at that same factory and put some of the other young boys that they um, that uh, Lewis Hine had photographed during that time and they are all covered sort of like with cotton balls and everything and a lot of them developed something similar to what coal miners had um, 
like they called it like a brown lung disease because they were inhaling so much cotton lint. Actually, Giles Newsom ended up going to World War I. I found that he was a veteran of World War I and died the year after he returned of the flu. So he did, however, go back to the cotton mill. His hand healed well enough. And then, of course, as a person with a degree in journalism and photography, I had to include the Newsies. And they were boys that were as young as six and seven years old, standing on the corners of major metropolitan areas and selling newspapers. And they would do it from the first thing in the morning until the last thing at night. And that inspired this quilt. And I have a little sort of bit of daybreak, but I really found these boys so interesting and used, of course, some news, news stories from that time period. These were taken in 1910. And here's a detailed shot showing this one little boy who was seven. So can you imagine your seven-year-old standing on a street corner at midnight hawking newspapers? I can't. Another big influence in my series, American Portraits, had been the Library of Congress has a collection of, of 175,000 photographs that were taken by the Farm Security Administration and the Office of War Information from 1935 to 1944. These photographs included, were taken by a multitude of, of uh, well-known, now well-known photographers such as Dorothea Lang, Walker Evans, and Russell Lee, and they have inspired this American Portrait series. So with these farmers, they resonated with me being from Ohio and originally from Ohio. So the first couple I did, I actually printed these on vintage feed sacks, which I collected from all sorts of uh, various locations, including eBay and, and friends who lived in Indiana and went to farm sales. So these are silkscreen on actual vintage feed sacks from the 1940s, which I think really puts them in a great context. And I love working with that sort of look. This is the images again on hand dye fabric, which you can see the difference. It's again, double um, and triple dyed imagery on, or, or fabric on um, with the hand silk screen images. But I tried to sort of reflect that dust bowl heat and dryness that is what I interpret must have felt like there. And here's a close up of that. You can see again, these are notes that those photographers made. So none of this I made up. So anything that you see on my quilts tends to be um, notations of the photographers. Here's another image that was taken in 1941 and it's reflected in a family farm. This was one of the largest that I made with the feed sacks. They were extremely heavy, um, very, very hard to print because they were very, very rough, but I think it's a dynamic piece. It's quite large, it's 90 inches wide. And as you can see from the detail, you can see how hard and rough the surface of that fabric is, but I think it still is effective. Wait a minute, there we go. And then another one, I used some boys with the men to reflect the second generation. These were on really nice, thin um, advertising feedback, so these were much easier to print. I think these are just captivating. I just love them. And then a tenant farmer from 1941 is reflected in a quilt of a lot of brown and black farmers, tenant farmers, cotton farmers, and these are hand dyed fabrics. This is actually a very recent quilt. I just completed this one and I continually add to my series. So when I do a series, I don't necessarily just go one after another. I go back to them, redo the screens, reburn the screens, make them different sizes, different different shapes, sometimes add a different person, take away another person. And I think, again, you can see that the, the fabric and the imagery, I think they just 
marry together just quite nice. Then, of course, I couldn't leave out these fantastic women who were the crux of how these people survived in the Dust Bowl. Not only were they working on the farms, but they were having children, taking care of the men and the boys. And again, I did a quilt on feed sacks with them. And I used older women, young women with their babies, because the babies were, of course, going to be the future workforce, and then a couple younger girls. And here is a close up of that. And again, you can see that these are silk screened onto the vintage feed sacks. And then uh, rounding out, of course, I had to do a little bit of a tribute to my, my Pittsburgh uh, hometown. And I found these wonderful images um, taken of steel workers. And that has created another series called Steel Town. And um, so I use those to make these quilts. And what I discovered was that I was able to find these dues pays, paid buttons. And so the dues paid buttons that they had to, when they paid their dues, there was not a, a withdrawal from your paycheck or something like that. They got a button, which was good for one month. Here is a, the shift change in Aliquippa in 1938. And then I will show you it resulted in a, a very large diptych, and there are a lot of the dues paid buttons, and I think it's really delightful. I made three of these, actually. It was first shift, second shift, and third shift, and all the colorations change as I envisioned what it would be like for someone arriving for a morning shift, for an evening shift, or the night shift, because at those times, they worked three shifts, 24 hours a day. And here's another one, dues paid. This piece has now been acquired by the Heinz History Center. It's on display there right now, and they will be keeping that, which is really great. And a detail, and you can see how many buttons are on there. I think I bought up every button that I found on eBay. And also with some leftover prints, occasionally I have the option what do I do with those? So I made this uh, accordion book with some of the leftover prints. And that's a really fun thing for me to do because it's something different from my normal work, but still utilizes the prints and the hand dyed fabrics. And so it's nice to have a three dimensional option, you know, for some of my work. So I'm going to finish up with the last of uh, my Navajo Boy by Edward Curtis. I just finished this quilt. This is brand new. And again, like I said, I continue to go back and add to the series. And I used a lot of hand dyed fabric here and just a minimal few um, uh, hand, uh, silk screen images. This is called Sedona Sunset. And I thank you very much for watching. And you can go to my website and see more if you are interested. And you can contact me that way as well if you have any questions. I'm going to stop sharing and send it back to Hannah. All right. Well, thank you so much, Patty. Um, all of us, that was really informative and fun to walk through your process and see so many um, pieces come to life as you talk about them. Um, we are going to start a... Um, little Q&A session, a discussion. Um, if you want to put them in the chat, I will share them and we'll go through them. Um, I do have a, a question to kind of kick it off here, Patty. So yes. how do you think photography has influenced our understanding of history? You have a journalism background and you've clearly been interested in photography. How do you think it's influenced our understanding of ourselves and history? Well, for me personally, I, I mean, I do, it, it is the old adage, a picture is worth a thousand words. I think that even in journalism and newspapers and magazines, even on and now uh, on television or social media, I think it's really, really um, important that the, an image, a photographic image is more compelling than and captures your attention immediately right and if you if you read an entire say an entire article in the new york times the reason sometimes you read that is because of the image for me it influences people's perception it brings it to life just like with i think my quilts 
I could talk about the Dust Bowl. I think that that would be somewhat interesting, but I think it's much more compelling to show images of what those people look like, how their lives were, much like Edward Curtis just, you know, documented, he didn't write a book, he photographed books. They were books of photographs. And I think that that was more important to, for people to connect to. They could actually see what people um, look like, how they were living, how they dressed, how they found their food. So yeah, I, I, I think it does have a more. Mm -hmm. Um, you have, we, we're getting questions in the chat now. So we'll start with Donna's question. Um, some of the quilt squares have a bent in square around some of the faces. So how oh, did you yeah. create that? I saw the, that little square. It's actually not a bent in square. Actually what it is, is um, in, a, in an effort to sometimes highlight a face or a piece of clothing, I will actually cut a, a I, I have all those extra prints. As I mentioned, I always print at least two for every one I need. So I will cut those extras into a shape and then line it up exactly over the bottom print and fuse that top on top. And sometimes it's very subtle and sometimes it's very obvious. But what it does is sort of give a little bit of a highlight, attracts your attention to eyes or maybe to their clothing, or in, for example, in the Boys of the Mines, you know, to <laughs> that they have a pack of cigarettes in their pocket, things like that. I mean, I find it all sort of, you know, you just start to look at all the details. And if you could just pop that little thing out, then I think people do notice it. It's also that lean in factor. I really, that's why I think I add the language. I, I don't want someone to just walk by and, and I want them to go, oh, what was that? What did I just see? And when I go to an exhibition, if I see someone standing and reading everything on my quilt, I think, oh, well, now I got them. <laughs> so yeah. that's a good success for me is if they take that moment and sort of take the whole thing in instead of just like, boom, flying by. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, there's, thank you all for your nice words in the chat. Um, well, they're great, thank you. Um, Lynn asked, can you put the name of the paper you adhered to the fabric for printing in a chat box? I think you called it freezer paper? No, it's just Reynolds Wrap freezer paper. It's called freezer paper. You can buy it at the Giant Eagle and it's 18 inches wide. And so, but you just iron it with a dry iron. And, and if you're printing on fabric with silkscreen or even Thermofax, um, I know a lot of uh, people use Thermofax. Um, it is so much easier to handle your fabric if you do that. Now you have to just do it with cotton fabric. You can't, well, you can iron polyester probably on it too, but I don't work with polyesters. I just work with 100% um, cotton because I'm dyeing them. But nevertheless, it, is, it, is, it makes the silkscreen process more easy to handle. Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, Katie asked, when you're starting a new project, do you start with a topic and then pick the photo or do you start with the photo? I start with a photo. If I, if I'm, if I'm sort of like at an impasse and I don't know what I want to do or work on next, I'll go on the Library of Congress and just literally sometimes I spend hours and hours for days. And mm -hmm. I, all I have to do is just find one. It was just like, that chief that I showed in the beginning, when I find one, then I'm like, okay, what year was that taken? And then you, you know, go to that next year and so on. With the Boys of the Mines, it was finding Porter Martin's image. And then what other photographs did Lewis Hine take that week, that month, that year at that mine? And so then you are able to formulate this sort of group of images. I usually have four to six images in a quilt. Yeah, yeah. And I also really enjoyed how much you use the Library of Congress as resource because they have so many photographs there that are just really incredible. fantastic. It is fantastic. And you can download, well, not all um, uh, images at a really high resolution, but you can download a lot of really fantastic high resolution images, which is what I need for a silkscreen the size of what I'm printing. Right. Um, and if they do not have it, they will rescan it for you and send you a disc. So it's never a lost cause. And I have had that done. I have had 
um, images that they've only had a small thumbnail and requested that they scan uh, and send you a disc. You have to pay for that, but it's worth it if you have a project that you really want to do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, we have another question. Um, I'd love to hear more about the conceptual reasoning behind printing on quilts how these quilts and other materials in theory relate to and provide for the individuals in the work. So I think like, why are you perhaps printing on um, quilts and fabric other than, you know, other, other Well, materials? I do understand that a lot of people say, well, you're, you're really a printmaker, not a, not a, 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 a quilt maker. And I, I really think there it's, it's threefold for me. Um, I have sewn my entire life, so I've always had this affinity for stitch. And, and I have always had um, certainly an interest in photography, having a minor in photography. I used to have a dark room. My gosh, in the old days, I mean, I had a real dark room. And so I had an interest in photography. And then dyeing fabric and silk screening are two of the you know, real delights of my work. Those are the really fun, fun parts. And so I think that melding those together and creating something that I think is somewhat unique and makes me satisfied to make is that's part of the important part. You know, I'm, I'm making something that I enjoy making. And so if I were to just print on paper, I'd probably end up having to stitch it somehow. So I might as well, you know, I enjoy the dyeing of the fabric. I enjoy the silk screening and the printing. I hate the quilting. I like the piecing. Well, I'm not a fan of the quilting. No, <laughs> Maybe no. if I would make smaller pieces, I would be, you know, less challenged. Yeah. Oh. Um, Vicki has another question, has a question, um, the text, it's also applied via screen printing? Yeah, the text, because the text is really a one-off, um, doing a silk screen for a little, one little section of text would not be efficient financially or otherwise. So the text is done with photo transfer paper. So that is a little bit of a digital piece mm -hmm. of um, work. And you, it's an iron-on photo transfer paper that I add the text. Yeah, um, I in the one that's here, you use text um, from Andrew Jackson for the resettlement right. project. Could you talk a little bit about why you use that specific text? Well, I found it, uh, you'd have to almost read it to understand. I found it stunning that at that time, and this was during the, um, the time period that they were moving all of the Native Americans into reservations. They were taking them from their homes. They were actually putting tribes together in the same reservations who were, who were enemies. And so it, it was a complete disaster. But what Andrew Jackson, Jackson wrote, and I think I have some of that text on that particular quilt, was sort of how they were doing them such a favor by putting them in these wonderful new places and that they didn't have to worry about survival. And, and he constantly refers to the red man, which of course, you know, the whole, the whole thing, if you, if you read it, it, when I read it, I researched what Andrew Jackson had written, what caused that emigration of the Native Americans into the reservations. And when I read that, I just thought, oh, well, that's gotta go on. Because then you understand, you see these dignified, beautiful, you know, Native American people who don't look fearful, who are scary to me, they look peaceful and kind, and then you put this text and you think, oh my goodness, it was sort of a trigger, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and, and I think um, what, what Curtis was able to do too was actually record um, languages as well. And music, so, yes. Music, um, which was also very important as part of the, the full, you know, the anthropological study. Um, but and yeah, he, it was really, I mean, he was well paid, but it was, he was actually an employee of J.P. Morgan. Right. So what, I mean, he was an employee. Um, J.P. Morgan was the one who was really the one interested in, in um, selling these volumes of the history of the Native American. So 
Curtis was an employee, and, and certainly he benefited, but he was the one living that mm -hmm. lifestyle for over 20 years, which is quite fascinating if you think about it, you know. Yeah, and, and the, the language of Andrew Jackson is quite jarring against what are pretty beautiful portraits um, to see that, that language um, anywhere near that kind of beauty is, is quite horrifying. Um, do we have, if you have any, any last questions, please put them in the chat. Um, yeah, and I, do you have any, any other questions from anyone? Patty, do you have anything else? Um, yeah, I think, I think most of mine were, I was really interested in how your journalism background really informed how you're bringing work that was largely made at the turn of the century and bringing it into now the 21st century um, and, and making it a contemporary conversation. You know, we don't often talk about child labor laws right now in the United States, but it's still an important discussion and something that's going on throughout the world. And I think what you're able to do with looking at these um, photographs and artworks and journalism from, you know, 1900, we're now able to start talking about 2021 now in a, in a different way. Well, to me, to be honest, I mean, I really do believe that all of the, the work that I do in those series, American portraits, we, we still have people starving and hungry in, the, in this country. So it, it, it touches back to the fact that that still exists. We still have child labor in this world and, and potentially even in our own country. We have discrimination against people um, which is certainly took place with the Native Americans and it continues in this country. So I think that, and, and the steel workers, the idea of a working man um, trying to support his family or a working woman trying to support her family, it's still an issue in this country. So I think sometimes when I make these, they connect to me on, on, on a historical level, but also are a reminder of, well, gee, that's still happening in maybe a little bit different way. So I, I like that kind of juxtaposition of making people think about that. Um, we have another question from Regina that says, do you long arm your quilts? No, I do not. I have a, um, a, a, a regular Bernina 440. So no, I do not. I have had a few done long arm by outside quilters in the last year because I was injured. And, and so um, that is easy, but no, I don't have a long arm. So that's why I struggle with the quilting part, trying to get a 100 inch quilt under a 440 on my dining room table can be an effort. <laughs> All right, we're doing, that was the last call for questions. If you do have any questions, um, you're free to email us as well as Patty. I'm putting your um, uh, website. Right, you can go on my website and um, you can always leave me a message or, or ask a question. I'm happy to talk to anybody. who. Yeah, and um, we really appreciate your time with us today, Patty, and everyone who was able to join us. Um, I'm just doing a quick screen share there so you can see. Um, just more information about this, but also um, we have a lecture next week talking about technology and its artistic legacy with Eric Carlton and Lori Hepner. Um, both of those artists use algorithms and 3D renderings and different ways to use the camera photography, um, but also technology. So we've really been able to get a great foundation here with you today, Patty, and we're so appreciative of you taking the time and well, thank you. letting us have your work here in Altoona. We are so excited. Thanks very much. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. We look forward to seeing you next week. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Bye. Margaret. Yes. Margaret, Margaret. Yes, yes. Do I what?